Are Neanderthals human too? Welcome to Answers News for Monday, September 19th, 2022. I'm Roger Patterson, joined today by Rocket Rob Webb <laughs> and, Tim, <laughs> Rob. and Tim Chafee. And we're going to be talking about that connection between humans and Neanderthals and some other stories today. And you might even get an answer to why I have a skull sitting up here on the table if you hang in long enough. There you go. All right, so our first story takes us to from phys.org to the connection between humans and Neanderthals. Mm -hmm. So here we have uh, people asking questions about how connected humans and Neanderthals are. And the paper examines some DNA comparisons and talks about hybridization and are we different species and how all those things are connected together. And as we, we start to think about these things, that's really kind of the core question, what makes us human? How are we different from things like chimpanzees and apes and flatworms mm -hmm. and other, <laughs> other things that we're supposed to be evolutionary cousins to? And they, they're examining the DNA here and looking at uh, fossils. And the layer that's added to this one is that rather than just looking at the DNA, they're looking at the DNA and then correlating that to some of the, the morphological structures, the shape of the bones, and see if they can find any connections between those. And a bit of a fascinating way to, to think about this, this is the first one that's been done that way. And the conclusions are very interesting, especially if we start thinking about these from a biblical perspective. That's right. So for a long time, as creationists, we've been saying that Neanderthals and humans are, you know, they're, Neanderthals are human, fully, fully human. human. Yeah. Uh, you know, the secular world has gone back and forth as classifying them as Homo neanderthalensis or Homo sapien neanderthalensis, whether it's a different subspecies or a different species. And uh, we've said all along, they're fully human. And what this study shows is that most humans have a bit of Neanderthal in them. Uh, which is no surprise to us. Guess what? They were human. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> it just confirms what we've been saying all along. But Roger, going back to what you were talking about, what makes us human, it's more than just the anatomy. And yes, there are anatomical differences between humans and apes, but what's even a, a bigger distinction is that human beings are made in the image of God. Okay, so that is the greatest distinction, whereas the animals, including the apes, are not made in God's image. So that's what separates us from them more than anything else. Yeah, and then just going back real quick, if you guys aren't familiar, it's that whole false narrative that says that Neanderthals are a different species or kind, you know, based on that evolutionary worldview. Whereas in the biblical worldview, we would expect to have that kind of overlap because we're all one race, one blood, like it says in Acts 17, 26. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So really, we're all one human race. We're all made in the image of God, all with equal value. And, and I, I just love it. here in this paper, they say, clearly the origin of humankind was more complex than previously thought. So, you know, they're having to rewrite the whole story again. It's not expecting the, in the evolutionary worldview because essentially evolutionists, they believe that, you know, we evolved differently from the, uh, from the, the, uh, the modern humans and the Neanderthals. Later, they came to interbreed with each other and you but throw if, Denisovans and Cro-Magnon and all yeah, the others. Yeah, in exactly. So, so they're, they're, they're confused from the evolutionary worldview, but bottom line from the biblical worldview, this is something really we would, we would expect. Yeah. It's not that confusing. We go back to Adam. Yeah. yeah. I'll go back to Adam and Eve. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty straightforward. And if we think about this, uh, biologically speaking, one of the key definitions for a species are organisms that can interbreed with one another. They're not geographically separated. So basically what this paper has done is shown us that these organisms can interbreed with one another and they were not necessarily geographically separated if they're able to do so. And so to call them two different species even defies the definition, the typical definition of, that we use of species in biology. Although we'll put a little asterisk there and say, um, the, the definition can change and how we define that mm -hmm. is, is yeah. kind of a man-made idea, but using a biblical framework, we are all one race in Adam. We all come from one blood, just like Paul says, and we trace these people back to the time of the dispersion of Babel. And we have people spreading out. You can go to Genesis 10 and 11 and read about those. You might even have a little map that shows where the different descendants, the 16 grandsons of Noah is a typical way to, to separate those out. And here we just have different characteristics of people group, but people are people. They're humans mm -hmm. all the way around That's as right. we think about this. Yeah, and we have an exhibit here at the Creation Museum on that. And one of the first exhibits you see is called Starting Points. And in there we, we show some of the variety within 
human, humanity throughout the last several thousand years. And uh, you know, some people will have facial structures that are a little bit different, but they're still fully human. And uh, so that's what we're pointing out. And Neanderthals are part of that display. We have three different skulls uh, from Neanderthals in there showing that they are fully human. So just because they might have thicker brow ridges or a little bit larger cranial case or things like that, it doesn't mean they're not human. Roger and I have larger <laughs> cranial case than Rob does because we're a lot bigger, but he's just probably smarter than both of us. <laughs> <laughs> At least when it comes the to chairs that. make it deceiving. It's not really. It's I, I, I had to elevate it almost entirely up just to match up with these guys because these guys are, yeah. So here, Rob, in the paper, it says um, ancient DNA is rarely well preserved in fossil specimens, so scientists need to recognize possible hybrids from their skeletons. This is vital for understanding our complex past and what makes us human. But is there another way to define humanity other than our bone structure and our DNA? Yeah, of course. I mean, like what Tim was saying back to, we are humans based on being made in the image of God. That's what makes us different than the animals. You know, you don't see animals going around, you know, like, like they were talking about making tools, you know, and all, all these different things and uh, setting up court systems. And, and, and really, we, we, we have that law written on our heart. You know, we, we, we desire the things God desires once we're born again, of course. But um, that's, that's really what makes us unique is that we're made in the image of God, but we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's what, what really makes us distinct what makes yeah. us human based on God's word, not the secular worldview. Yeah. So rather than buying into those evolutionary assumptions and stories, we need to start with God's word and then we don't wind up committing all those, those errors. Mm -hmm. That's right. All right. On to South Carolina, South Carolina house passes abortion ban, uh, after adding rape and incest exceptions. So as we've noted multiple <clears throat> times after the Dobbs decision, uh, Roe v. Wade and, and Casey Planned Parenthood versus Casey being shot down, uh, we have all these, the, the laws going back to the states now rather than having a national uh, structure of that. And so every state, there are these, the red and blue states as we call them are battling uh, for these things. So here in South Carolina, the House passed a, an abortion or attempted to pass an abortion ban that was uh, excluded exceptions for rape and incest. It didn't pass. Uh, they didn't have enough votes. For, so they added those things in and it was able to pass the house, and this was a few days ago, and so Rob, you had some follow-up on what happened yeah, after this, this story was released. Yeah, this, this was uh, House Bill 5399, so I think back on Thursday, they actually went, it went to the Senate for a vote and it failed to pass it, so now it's basically being kicked back to the house again, and essentially what they did is they doubled down on their current six-week ban that they have right now already in place, so I think the bottom line is we need to remember uh, it's just, just to be praying for these lawmakers just to do the right thing before God, to think biblically through this, to protect our pre-born neighbors at all costs, of course. And so, um, yeah, and, and it just, it's just a reminder that, you know, ultimately it's not through the law, it's not through politics that's really going to end abortion in, in our nation. It's only through God's word and the gospel. It's through transforming hearts and minds that we're going to be able to do that. And we actually have a really powerful exhibit called the Fearfully Wonderfully Made exhibit here. It's right outside those doors if you guys haven't checked it out. We have a new one coming, actually, that's... Um, in less than a month, Lord that, willing. Less yeah. than a month that we have. It's going to be a really powerful pro-life exhibit. Talks about, you know, from the biblical worldview that all children are blessings from God, made in the image of God, and that's why they deserve protection. Yeah, from the moment of fertilization. Now, we can look at different bills like this, and we can <laughs> people can debate whether or not this is a good idea or a bad idea to include these uh, exceptions and everything. And, and you can understand the debate in some cases, but ultimately what we have to... What we have to think about, these are just pragmatic ways of trying to reduce the number of abortions, but what we really want is to see the hearts and the minds of people change on this issue altogether, to return to this, this concept, this understanding of the sanctity of human life, mm -hmm. and why is life sacred? human life sacred because we're made in God's image. It goes back to that every time. It's not because, you know, people who are against abortion just want to control a woman's body or anything. It has nothing to do with that. It is, we believe this is a human being made in God's image from the very beginning, from the moment of fertilization. And therefore they are, they're of limitless value and they're, we should be protecting them. And then what all these, yeah. uh, what do these bills often do is try to promote some milestone or marker where now it's okay to kill the baby and before, before it's okay and after it's not. And that really shows us that even these lawmakers, as good of in intentions they may have, are being inconsistent, not, with, not even within their own position, but clearly with the Bible. The Bible would say, 
life is valuable from that moment of fertilization and we don't draw lines where it's okay to have an abortion, murdering the child, and at some point later, uh, it's not okay. That's, that's an arbitrary distinction and we have no basis for that. And that ultimately winds up creating unjust systems as we see promoted in scripture. And as Tim noted, we've, we've, we are thankful that this is gonna have the result of saving some lives. But ultimately, uh, we, would, we would say that it's only gonna be a good law if it truly abolishes abortion and stops those things from happening. And we have to we have to think through those things carefully as we do that. And, and one thing to note, I think there's a lot of times where these sort of issues come up, and I don't know if we we get to stress this enough. But you know, the, there are people who visit here. There are people who watch who have probably gone through something like this with yeah. abortion. And and while we view this as something that is a, a tragedy, something that's terrible, something of well, murdering the child, that's right. um, God's grace is sufficient, and you know, Christ died on the cross for all of our sins, and so that person can find forgiveness for that as well through the blood of Christ. Yeah, it's not the unforgivable sin. I mean, it's, yeah, it, like like Tim just beautifully said, I think that's what we need to always remember. And and if, if, if you guys want to know more about, you know, the whole exceptions for rape and incest, we actually have some good web articles on our website right now, answersingenesis.org. Uh, you can spend millions of years on our website, by the way, researching all sorts of different stuff. And uh, But the, we, we got some really good articles that talks about this more. And also just remember to be praying for our nation because at the very end of this article, it talks about President Joe Biden basically calling for um, Congress to essentially codify this right of abortion on demand into federal law because like Roger was saying earlier, the reversal of Roe v. Wade was just a court opinion. It was a fallacious court opinion. It didn't actually do anything in terms of the legality at the, at the federal level. It just gave the, the, the so-called right back to the states. And so now President Joe Biden and his team are trying to codify this. So just remember to be praying for our nation as well that they go back to, to God's law and that and that basically that um, that viewpoint that all children are blessings from the Lord. Jeremiah 1 5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So no child is ever a mistake, no boy or girl is ever an accident. All right, so let's move from <laughs> South Carolina across to the other coast to California. And in California, we have this headline: Mandate forcing churches to pay for abortions is unconstitutional. So this was a, a case where the uh, state health agency uh, had told several churches who were offering um, uh, insurance to their staff, they had more than 50, so they were under this mandate, that they had to offer abortion services as part of that. And several of these churches appealed that. Uh, one of them, a supporter church of ours, Calvary Chapel Chino Hills, mm -hmm. Uh, was part of this lawsuit, and they have successfully sued with the help of the Alliance Defending Freedom, and the court has determined that, yes, it's unconstitutional to require them to uh, provide these services in their insurance because it would go against their sincerely held religious beliefs. Yeah, so I mean, it's just it's just surprising we even have to talk about this nowadays. I mean, just think about it one generation ago. Wait, I mean, this was... It's California. <laughs> It's true. not surprising anymore. <laughs> Nowadays it's not, but I mean, you just think about it, like one, two generations ago. I mean, this was just a given, right? You yeah. weren't you, you weren't doing that, but I mean, yeah. Just let's just continue to pray for these churches in Cal California that they continue standing firm on God's word, that they resist this basically tyranny is what it is, tyranny against them. And it just reminds me of Proverbs eight thirty six that all those who hate God ultimately love death, and that's what we're seeing that just with this wicked state of California. So, and just, you know, so much for the tolerance of, of, of the left, right? You always th think about that. They're basically trying to force their wicked view while suppressing others. And, you know, it also just, I, I think about the whole mantra of safe, legal, and rare abortions, whatever happened to that, right? So obviously they're not neutral. They're trying to push that, trying to make that the norm, of course. And we're, 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 just, we're seeing this in California. It seems like other states are kind of also uh, slowly jumping on board there. And what was surprising to me, the opinion for the court was, um, proclaimed by somebody who was appointed by President Obama, uh, who was uh, very much against the pro-life position, mm -hmm. and yet, but trying to uphold the Constitution. Yes, and be, be, yep. uh, right. In and, that sense, and, and yeah, and mm -hmm. so this one, Gavin Newsom, the governor, is just saying they're they're planning spending a bunch of taxpayer dollars in California to more than two hundred million dollars to pay this. people from other states to come and have abortions. I mean, yeah. that's just out of state residents to be able to kill their children and really it's murder. That's why we call it abortion is murder, it's child sacrifice because life is made in the image of God from the moment of fertilization. So basically they're if you if you think about it that way, they're basically paying for parents to murder their child by coming to California and they're paying for that through tax dollars. So I mean, yeah, you just, just think about that. And then trying to force churches to pay for 
that yeah, as well. Exactly. It's just, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, it's one thing to say that this is something legal that the person can go do. It's another thing to make people pay for it who don't want to be paying for it. It's another thing to make churches be paying for it through... Uh, it's just a, a bunch of layers of wickedness, really. And, and yeah, yeah. All right, moving across the ocean to Africa. Okay, a Roger, with the geography yeah, skills like today. It. Look at all these seven million year old practice set our ancestors on the course to humanity. A new study finds. Uh, so this takes us to the study of a fossil that was found some years ago, and it's claimed to be seven million years old. And this is part of the hominin group. So these are the group hominids, is all the apes and all their the great apes and all their ancestors and fossils. And then the hominin line is the line that's supposed to lead off of there to the human species. And so this is one of those supposed ancestors in our history. It is Sahelanthropus chadensis, coming from the country Say that of Chad. Times fast. Just once. I got it out <laughs> once. <laughs> and uh, the, the main claim here is that at some point we had to go from walking on four legs to walking on two to become human. And so they're always looking for those, those fossils that will support that. Uh, up here at the Creation Museum, Dr. Menton had created the Lucy exhibit and examined some of those things. And one of the key claims is that this particular fossil, and I've got, here's the skull. I told you we'd get to this eventually. <laughs> so here's the skull of Lucy's kind, afarensis, uh, Australopithecus afarensis. And if you look at and we orient the, the skull in this position, and we look at this hole that's in the base of the skull where the spine comes out, yeah, the spine connects and the, the um, medulla oblongata, the spinal cord comes out of that portion. And we stick a stick in there, it goes at an angle like this because she would have been down on four legs and that's a more comfortable position. You ever been on your knees for more than about five minutes? What happens to your neck trying to hold it up? <laughs> it gets tired. <laughs> so the claim is this species, uh, not this skull, but the one represented here in the article, its opening goes more straight down, which would support the claim that it was an upright walking individual. You guys buying that? Uh, <laughs> Well, we know that certain apes can, for a time, walk upright. It doesn't mean that it's real comfortable for them. And they even talked about that in the yeah, article, that it's yeah. not something right, that would right, be right. real comfortable. But how do they know that this is a one-off, something that's been a little more deformed, that um, they don't know that it had you know, that it had any offspring that would have led to anything? Yeah. Here's, here's some images of the, of the skull, uh, reconstructed skull there. Yeah. Yeah, and essentially they said they had, they had to look at a femur and I think two arm bones, really, and, and then part of the skull. So really, that, that's it. They, they, they make it sound like they made like, you know, like this huge discovery, all this fossil, this full skeleton, but really that was it, just, just a femur and two arm bones. Really had to cost them an arm and a leg to get that. But overall, there's just a lot of storytelling in this. Overall, you have to separate the facts from the fiction here. Um, and, and whenever you're reading these kind of articles, you have to realize that there's assumption upon assumption upon assumption that they've already rejected God in his word and instead they replace it with a worldview called naturalism basically where they have they that they look at everything through that naturalistic uh you know, framework that basically has, has to explain through naturalistic causes. So they're not neutral, of course. So w w when you're reading the, these, these kind of things, you, got that, you have to make sure you look out for that. It's not just going to be the brute facts, or the brute data, you know, the evidence speaks for itself, like they always say, you know. They have to interpret it based on that worldview. And they're interpreting all of these bones, because we all have the same evidence. We all have the same bones, the same arm bones, leg bones, you know. Uh, skulls here, but how we're actually interpreting it is going to matter. So, and one um, of the authors stu or studies authors says, "We proved yeah. Darwin right. That's kind of cool, but that's not what science Be does." Because yeah. Darwin suppose Darwin said that he thinks being able to walk up on uh, up on two legs was the spark that started it all, yeah. and so then the the study says that. Uh, it, was a, it was a big differentiator for apes and, because it freed up their hands so they could start making tools and that's ultimately what led to human. <laughs> and it and used thought, less energy I, I to thought, walk what on a, Wait legs. a second. When we're making tools or things, what, we sit down. And apes can sit down. They have their hands free. And you all don't just walk and make tools as you're walking? No. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's so absurd and yet people will just gloss over the storytelling and think, yeah. oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. No, it doesn't make any sense when you stop and think about it. Yeah, if you stop to think about it, they didn't actually prove anything. Actually, they, right. what, they did what was called begging the question, circular reason reasoning by essentially assuming that we came from ape-like ancestors. So they see these fossils that are ape-like and say, well, therefore, we evolved from these ape-like ancestors. You so you kind of see that, yeah. that circular reason, it that issue there. They tend to support their hypothesis in some sense, but there are a lot of gaps and a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We've got a yeah. couple of resources over here that are connected to this. Um, 
So thinking about human ancestry and, and the human connection back to our previous Neanderthal story and those, uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen's book, Traced, and a bunch of videos he's done connected to those really great resources to check out. And then there in front of Rob mm -hmm. uh, from Dr. Menton, uh, Three Ways to Make an Ape Man. And it'll basically go in and describe uh, mm -hmm. those the fossils that we found that are supposed to be in that hominin line, that human ape to human line, and how he, as an anatomist, examines them and, and looks at them and shows they're if either people still apes have DVD or human. players, or you, know, oh, yeah. <laughs> or you could get a subscription <laughs> Answers to Answers.tv yep. and watch it right on there. Absolutely, yep, exactly. Good plug, Rob. There you go. <laughs> See, I was, I was looking out for you. All right, from the Federalist, Texas Board of Education pauses plan to wokeify public school history instruction. Uh, so the basics here are. Uh, the Texas Board of Education had a working panel to restructure the social studies guidelines and the way the curriculum would work. Um, I used to do that when I was teaching back in Wyoming, so familiar with that process. And they came to this conclusion that we should change a bunch of things, get rid of teaching about the Constitution in high school and all kinds of different things. And that didn't go so well when the public got a hold of it. No, when the public found out about it, there was an uproar, and so this they, they decided to table this discussion for several more years till 2025, 2025 and yeah. then they're going to have to talk Sounds about it again. But yeah, what they wanted to do is what you see in a lot of places where they're removing what has traditionally been viewed as American history and trying to diversify it. And we were talking about this a little bit. There's nothing wrong with us learning about America's past uh, warts and all. And there, there were right. lots of sins committed by our founding fathers lots and the expansion yeah. west and mm -hmm. lots of lots of sin there. We right, but to learn sure. only about those things yeah. and not some of the, the good things or just how, this was, how the country was established in the first place is also skewing it very far the other direction. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we've seen, and the, the article calls it wokeifying, uh, we've seen this in a lot of other states. And it's surprising that this is about to happen in Texas. Mm -hmm which is generally viewed as a very conservative state. Everything's bigger. But, <laughs> but what happens is people don't pay attention. And the, the side that wants to continually take over the education system or to promote these things, they don't sleep. You know, they, they are paying attention and they mm -hmm. are working on these things. And, you know, Christians, we need to be aware of what's out there and what's being taught rather than just always... Um, seeding that ground or just, you know, staying out of the battle. This, sorry, it is a, a battle. It is, a, you know, ultimately the, the fight we're involved in is a spiritual battle. Paul tells us in Ephesians mm -hmm. 6. And so we need okay. to be aware of that we might be tired. We may not want to fight it, but that's what we're called to do. And uh, we got to do that uh, in, in the right manner, of course. And if you guys aren't familiar with that whole term woke, wokeify, and what that means, it basically goes back to that critical social justice, critical race theory, of course, about the oppressors and the oppressed based on your skin color and all that stuff. Basically and Marxism. Basically <laughs> cultural Marxism at its core. And I, th I think we have some really good resources as well on our website. You also can go to our bookstore, Fault Lines by Vody Bauckham is a really good resource if you guys want to check that out more. And they use a lot of terms like inclusion, diversity, and typically whenever you see those, those are kind of the buzz words for critical social justice so whenever you see that but ultimately I mean I just thought of the war on children happening all around us with this indoctrination that's, that's just working its way more and more into the school systems and I think we, you know it's it's something that uh, our uh, founder Ken Ham says all the time as Christians we need to be like the sons of Issachar who have understanding of the times wake up to the war that's really just raging around us and it reminds me of Matthew 18:6 which says, you know, if whoever causes children to stumble and to sin, better for him to have a great millstone around his neck and drowned in the depth of the sea. That should be a really scary warning for us that we need to be making sure that we're caring for all of our children, we're, we're equipping them, and we're not teaching them these anti-biblical kind of doctrines, these Marxist ideologies here. We need to be teaching them God's word and be standing on God's word alone for that next generation. And turning to the age of the earth issue, new technique shows old temperatures were much hotter than thought. Uh, so here we have a re-examination of some techniques that use uh, isotopes of oxygen. I was kind of geeking out on the chemistry <laughs> stuff in this one. Uh, looking at if we have different oh, uh, cores. Oh, sorry. <laughs> wake up, Jim. Uh, we can look at the layers and look at the isotope oxygen. Or, isotopes of oxygen in them and carbon and others and compare those, we can basically determine the temperature at that time and that place based on uh, how the sedimentation happens inside the water. And they're specifically looking at these little creatures called foraminifera or forams. 
and uh, they've, they're very amazing little creatures. They create this calcium carbonate shell, and uh, they extract that and try and determine the isotope ratios to tell you how hot the ocean was. And basically what they've concluded in this, using a new technique that clumps the isotopes together to try to get rid of some of the assumptions, is that there were some really hot oceans back in the past, as much as 20 degrees Celsius. Tim, what could have produced hot oceans mm. in a different explanation? Right, ring a bell you know, from, as the a, Bible from a biblical perspective, from what we talk about our model, this creation flood model, is at the beginning of the flood, you had the fountains of the great deep breaking open, which mm -hmm. would involve all sorts of volcanic activity, geysers, that, which would heat up the oceans. And this has been part of our model for a very long time, is that you'd have warmer oceans in uh, during the time of the flood and even afterwards till it started to slowly cool down. So we can explain a much warmer ocean. And that would allow them to level. grow very fast and we'd get mm -hmm. this this higher signature of the of the isotopes, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm trying to count how many 50 cent words Roger has said in this episode. <laughs> there are just a plenty few. of big, long syllable Everyone's words. Everyone's kind of glazed over now, right. like, all right. We're <laughs> <laughs> Overall, I mean, this just wasn't a very cool article. It wasn't that hot stuff, really. But um, yeah, like like Tim was saying, you know, it just, it just kind of goes back from the flood. You know, when we're looking at that biblical worldview, the oceans were a lot warmer than today, back in that pre-flood ocean time frame. And there's just a lot of evolutionary assumptions in this one over and over again. They're making assumption upon assumption. Just make sure you watch out when you're reading these types of evolutionary articles. When you're, when but they're constantly that. smuggling in the idea of if, if this happened in the past, this type of extreme climate change happened, we need to look at this so we can know what's going to happen in our future. And it fosters that climate alarmism. Yeah, I, I feel like they can't help themselves. It's like every week we're seeing more and more articles about the climate change. And if they, if they have an opportunity, let's stick that in there. How do we can? Here it is in the next one. <laughs> it's just, to me, it's always interesting yeah. how many times they talk about these huge temperature swings in the past, and, and not even always the distant past. I mean, you have like the Little Ice Age, the medieval warm period and everything. All of that before the Industrial Revolution, what caused those things? If, if man is to blame for all of this, um, you know, the great climate change that we're supposedly seeing in the last hundred years, and yeah, temper temperatures fluctuate, but uh, what's caused all of it before yeah. all these extra greenhouse gases from the industrial Re revolution from cars and everything um, maybe it has a lot more to do with just natural cycles right <laughs> for mm -hmm. the way things work and that's what this story yeah. uh, why were reptiles such an evolutionary success story a little edit there mm -hmm. uh, for the harvard <laughs> gazette uh, the same idea <laughs> this rapid climate change during the uh, permian triassic uh, extinction event caused changes in the structure. So it's been it's been the idea that these these rapid heating events or cooling events changed things. But what this study did is they looked at the things around those layers and figured out that they had that change had already been happening 30 million years before. But from a biblical perspective, that's all just imaginary time, and these are all just examples of things we find buried in the in the fossil record as a result of Noah's flood. Mm -hmm. Right. right. You, you don't need long periods of time. You just need the right conditions. And so yeah. during the flood, you have these things being buried in successive layers. And uh, so it's just, I'm, I'm interested in this one. It's a, the, the picture that's being used is the same one we, we had used. We used this picture a couple weeks ago. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we didn't do it. It was talking about mammal size. Yeah, right. The size uh, of, it was just a, size of things after what, whatever magazine or website used right. it. They, they've used the same picture twice. So I hope the artists are getting paid well for Stock it. Stock photos. <laughs> yeah, Stock photos. <laughs> All right, so to uh, present you guys with some opportunities to learn more and grow more uh, here at Answers in Genesis, we love to equip the saints for the work of ministry and take these things back to your local churches and help them. Um, Answers Bible Curriculum is one of our big products. Uh, I spent about 10 years of my life <laughs> devoted to that project, and uh, we have that in uh, a Bible study form that's for Sunday schools, and there's a digital form of it that you can access. I know a lot of larger churches like to spread those things out to their teachers and things digitally, mm -hmm. as well as a homeschool version of this that Dr. Sneed has worked on, uh, continuing to expand that. Yeah. And then uh, thinking about uh, bringing those things to life in your homeschool, we can connect those things to, to our kids and, and train them and, and grow them up, mm -hmm. as well as our coming uh, VBS talking about the armor of God that we read about in Ephesians 6 and keepers of the kingdom and some, some pretty fun things in there. My son's excited about that. It's like his favorite part in the Bible. He tells me all the time, the armor of God. I love the armor of God. <laughs> yep. So this is a, a great opportunity. Uh, you can get online and find some more information about those at answersvbs.com and see some, some cool videos we've got there. Mm -hmm. 
But that's all the time we've got for today, and we'll be hoping to see you next time on Answers News. God bless. God bless.